Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson, also he was known as the first Viscount Nelson or Lord Nelson. He was a British flag officer in the Royal Navy. Uh, he was inspirational in leading a superb grasp of strategy and unconventional tactics, which resulted in a number of decisive naval battles, uh, naval victories, <clears throat> uh, particularly during the Napoleonic Wars between 1797 and 1815. He suffered serious injuries during these years, losing the sight in his right eye at the Battle of um, Calvi in, in uh, Corsica. Corsica. <clears throat> in his right arm, he lost at uh, Santa Cruz in uh, Tenerife. On October 20th, 1805, the 33 ships of the French and Spanish fleets put to sea in an attempt to invade Britain. The British fleet, with only 27 ships, met them off the coast of Spain on October 21st, led by Admiral Lord Nelson, which is referred to as the Battle of Traflagar. This was to be Nelson's last and most famous victory. Before the battle, Nelson sent his famous signal to the fleet. England expects every man will do his duty. Nelson had devised an unorthodox battle plan that called for his ships to attack the enemy broadside in two parallel lines, breaking into the enemy's formation and blasting his opponents at close quarters. As Nelson watched from the deck of the HMS Victory, the battle soon turned into a confused melee of combat between individual ships. The fighting was at such close quarters that the Victory became entangled with the French ship Redoubtable. <clears throat> they were locked in the battle and from his perch in the upper rigging of the Redoubtable, a French sharpshooter took aim at the prized target on the deck of the Victory, fired and sent a musket ball into Nelson's left shoulder. Continuing its journey, the bullet tore a path through Admiral, the Admiral's uh, upper body before smashing into his lower back. It was a mortal wound. Nelson was carried below the decks while the battle enraged on. He lived long enough to hear the news of the redoubtable surrender and the fleet's victory after four and one half hours of combat. <clears throat> on his deathbed, Captain Hardy approached Admiral Nelson and they shook hands affectionately. And Lord Nelson said, well, Hardy, how goes the battle? How goes the day with us? Very well, my lord, replied Captain Hardy. After a few more words about ensuring that his wife and his daughter were to be taken care of, he died. This was an eyewitness count that was observed by Dr. William Beatty, who was the physician on board of the Victory and, and, and attended Nelson as he lied dying. Um, again, William Beatty, and it was the, the article was the death of Lord Nelson, which he wrote in 1807. They won the battle against Napoleon's fleet, and the Royal Navy never, never again seriously was was seriously challenged by the French fleet in a large-scale engagement ever again. <clears throat> so, how goes your battle? How goes your war against the Lord of this world? Are you equipped properly as a Christian soldier? As the song we just sang. 
As you know, I have served this country for four years in the Air Force and 18 years as a soldier in the Army. We are referred to as soldiers in the New Testament a few times by the Apostle Paul. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, Paul says, You therefore must endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And also in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 25, you don't have to turn there, but Epiphanodus, um, if I'm saying his name correctly, he was referred uh, to as my, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier. And also in Philemon uh, chapter 1 and verse 2, um, Archippus uh, is referred to as a fellow soldier as well. Of all the apostles, Paul had the most exposure to the Roman soldiers. He was in prison for two years with a Roman soldier on duty to guard him. And Paul observed his captor daily for those two years. He was inspired to write four epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. An amazing, and also an amazing analogy, comparing the Roman soldier's armor which Paul knew intimately, oh boy, I can't even say the word. An amazing analogy comparing the Roman soldier's armor, which Paul knew intimately, to what a Christian must have in order to fight their spiritual battles then and now. My purpose for this sermon is to go into great detail on the armor of God. To examine the armor that inspired Paul to write about this and how this analogy will help us in our daily battle against the evil one as well as our own fleshly desires. I have heard many sermons about the armor of God over the years. But I haven't heard one recently. This is my attempt in covering the, uh, this important topic. The whole armor of God, as you can see on the, on the slide there. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6 if you want to read along. Ephesians chapter 6 starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of the wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. To stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer, and supplication in the Spirit, 
being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, as Paul says, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. In these scriptures, you can easily pick out the why do we need the spiritual armor. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of the wickedness in the heavenly places. The Bible often illustrates the Christian life as a battle against sin and Satan. Satan is our enemy, our adversary. That is his name, adversary, Satan. We are on the front lines of the battle. He and his demons have us in their sights. Their sharpshooters are looking at us. They do not need to focus on the rest of humanity since they already have them enslaved. They're focused on us, the followers of Christ. We are soldiers of Christ in a spiritual warfare. This is our battle. So how goes the battle? How goes the battle? That's my title for the sermon. How goes the battle? So what can we do about the devil's attempt to influence us to do evil, to disobey God? God provides us with a defense. Ephesians 6 and verse 10 again. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We must stand. We must stand. We are to be taking a stand against wrongdoing. Stand your ground. In Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 1, says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you stand. In which you stand. And also in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Paul urges his readers three times to stand with the armor. An army is no better than its discipline. I've witnessed that firsthand serving in the army. It is good to say that we will stand, but, but talk is not action. Talk is talk. We need to stand up and acknowledge the commands of our great God by obeying them. We must, as Paul tells us in Timothy, or he tells us to Timothy in uh, 1 Timothy Chapter 6 and verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. 
Fight the good fight of faith. Now before we can fight the good fight, we must suit up. The armor of God is made up of six items. So let's take a look at each piece of this spiritual armor and see how it can enable us to be victorious as soldiers for Christ in our battle against the spiritual host of wickedness. The first item is the belt of truth. <clears throat> the belt of truth. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14. Stand, therefore. There's one of those stands. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Now the New International Virgin, Version of this um, says, Stand firm in the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Truth is the belt that holds the other pieces of the armor in place. The ancient Romans called this belt a baltus. Uh, the Roman legions typically used the baltus to hang their sword and other relevant pieces of military equipment on it. See, there's another picture of it right there. Uh, these, uh, these belts were made from wide strips of leather and highly um, rank and military Romans preferred their belts to be decorated with valuable gemstones and metals. In the Roman ranks, a single belt to support a dagger and the bearer's uh, tunic took over from the traditional two cross belts that properly were worn during the Augustan era. Uh, this was a wider belt that went around the midsection. As you can see from the picture, it actually is holding the breast of plate, which, as you can see in the scriptures, actually follows that, and it's kind of like together in the same sentence. It holds it in place and secured to the body. And you also can hold on to your, your dagger, your sword, and all these things that attach to it, and also keeps your tunic in place. Now they... The Weymouth uh, New, New Testament version uh, calls it a girdle of truth. Girdle of truth. In Bible times, the girdle about the waist held together the soldier's garments, which might otherwise hamper its movement while marching or engaging in combat. Albert Barnes' notes on the Bible says the girdle, and he called it a girdle or also a wide sash, was often highly ornamented and was the place where they carried their money, their sword, their pipe, their writing instruments. This first part of the armor was to help secure other parts holding the sword, possibly holding the tunic down, and was at the center of the body, the center of the body. Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 5 it says, righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. This belt also served to protect the growing area and the bowels. The belt of truth protects our innermost being as we are covered by it. And it makes sense because where should our truth, where should truth be in our lives? Where should it be? The very center, the very core of our being is where truth lies. That's where truth should be. We should center ourselves on God's truth. And on that belt of truth also hangs the, the sword. The Word of God. Because the Word of God depends on truth. The Word of God depends on truth. It is the truth. Remember John chapter 17 and verse 17. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. 
The spiritual significance is that God does not simply want us to point at the truth. He wants us to wear it and to have it wrapped about us. The belt holds everything in place and serves to carry the sheath that holds the sword of the Spirit for ready access. Some people, well, some people, they do have the sword of God's Word. They do have it. They have their Bibles. But without the belt of truth, they come to reckless conclusions. They determine their own interpretations of what the Word of God says. Even Satan quoted from the Holy Scriptures, but he twisted them to mean something else for his purpose. So, how goes your battle against Satan? Much better if you remember to fasten the belt of truth around you. The belt of truth refers to the, the truths of the scripture as opposed to the lies of Satan. Satan is the father of lies, as we know. Jesus said that in John 8, verse 44. Jesus also said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's verse 32. Satan would have us believe that we are sinful, lost, and without hope. The truth is that God's love and salvation has set us free from sin and death. Just as the truth serves as a belt, holding together the full armor of God, so is our personal commitment to the truth. To live in a life that is upright, where integrity and honesty are vital to our Christian life. The second item is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. The second part of Ephesians 6.14, it says, Have on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the Greek word here for breastplate is thorax. Covering the chest cavity, the thorax. The, the, the Romans, they wore a segmented uh, armor called Dolorica Segmentata, which is pictured right there. Now, the segmented armor, known as the Dolorica Segmentata, was used by the Roman soldiers as a type of personal armor. Uh, a, it was purely a Roman invention. The Dolorica Segmentata... It seems to have involved is from a design of the torso armors of some of the Roman gladiators. Uh, this armor was essential, essentially composed of numerous long straps of laminated iron which were joined together either with metal hooks or with leather straps. Owing to its structure, the armor was flexible enough to enable easy torso movements for the soldier. At the same time, the use of the armor ensured maximum protection to people wearing it. Uh, this armor was introduced about the first century uh, B BCE during the reign of Emperor Augustus. However, um, ar archaeological evidence uh, suggests that by the mid middle of the second century, uh, its use declined uh, to a great extent, and uh, the main reason was basically because of the costlier manufacture and the tedious maintenance that you had to perform on these. Now, the breastplate was an important article of defense that protected the front torso and all the vital organs from a mortal wound. Now, there was another uh, breastplate that was composed of a solid piece of metal, and that's called the, the cuirass. Uh, Byron speaks on this. Uh, the word rendered here as breastplate, uh, the Greek thorax, denote, uh, denoted the, the, the kuros. Um, Latin is the lorica, of course, or the coat of mail. Uh, the armor that covered the body from the neck to the thighs and consisted of two parts, one covering the front and one, the other one covering the back. 
It was made of, uh, now some of, the, some of these were a solid piece and others were made of rings or formed scales or plates that was fastened together so they'd be flexible uh, and protect against swords, you know, spear, arrow. Uh, this particular one here, I don't see a whole lot of flexibility with that. But um, especially when the sun shone directly onto the armor, it could become very hot. So to avoid uh, being burnt or even pinched the, by the moving metal plates, the soldiers always wore a sturdy tunic underneath of their armor. Now the breastplate covers the heart and shields it and other vital organs. The Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. It's Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. This is what Christ's righteousness does for you. It protects you from all of Satan's accusations and charges. This righteousness is not made up of the good deeds you do. The Bible is clear that none of us are righteous in ourselves. Romans 3 verse 10. The breastplate of righteousness is entirely the righteousness of Jesus, which he gives us freely when we accept him as our Savior. Righteousness is not our own. But righteousness is what covers us and protects us. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59 verses 16 and 17. And this is from the New American Standard Version. Then his own arm brought salvation to him. And his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. We'll be getting to the helmet of salvation soon. A soldier with a breastplate usually goes into the fight with confidence. Think about it. The devil is constantly attacking us with lies, accusations, reminders of past sins in our lives. If we do not wear the breastplate of righteousness like Paul is telling us to, these will penetrate deep into your heart. The only way we can experience victory in our battle against the devil is through confidence that the righteousness of Jesus covers our hearts and that we are forgiven. So how goes your battle? Another interesting aspect of the breastplate is that some might have only had the front torso protected and not their back. It was assumed that a soldier would not turn their back towards the enemy and retreat. Likewise, Christians should stand firm and never surrender any ground to the devil. Instead, let the devil flee from your steadfast loyalty. James 4, verse 7. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The breastplate of righteousness protects our heart. Righteousness is a state of being right with God through obedience and by His forgiveness of our sins. God's commandments define righteousness. God's commandments define righteousness. Psalm 119, Psalm 119 and verse 172. My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. God's commandments are righteous. Where is the law of God to be written? In your heart. In your heart. 
Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 14. Let me read it again. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. They go together. They go together. The third item is the shoes of the gospel. Shoes of the gospel. Ephesians uh, 6, verse 15. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The NIV says, your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And the Weymouth New Testament version says, as well as the shoes of the good news of peace, a firm foundation for your feet. Now the Kaliga are the legendary military shoes that are worn by the ancient Roman legions in the Calvary. The, the Kaliga were heavy-soiled boots extensively used by these troops of ancient Rome throughout the Republic and through the imperial eras. These shoes here have become truly symbolic, some symbolic of the rise of the Roman Empire with the Martian cavalry expanding its borders far and wide. The Caliga were strikingly different from today's military boots. I'm familiar with those. Air could pass freely through the bearer's feet. They were particularly good at reducing the chances of getting blisters from the nonstop marching. I know I've got some blisters while marching. It also helps with chronic foot disabilities such as tinea and, uh, and trench foot, which were curbed by the regular use of these shoes. Cleaver were most common among soldiers up to the rank of centurion, as they did most of the marching. Interesting fact here is um, Emperor Gaius Julius Caesar, Gaius Julius Caesar, he was better known by a nickname that was given to him as a young boy by the soldiers during their campaign in Germania under his father Germanicus. His name was Caligua, which means little boots. Emperor Caligua, little boots. Soldiers marching into battle must have comfortable shoes. As soldiers of Christ, we must put on gospel shoes that will allow us to march wherever our Lord leads. That will allow us to march whenever our Lord leads. The Apostle John says, He who says he abides in him, Jesus, ought himself to also walk just as he, Jesus, walked. That's 1 John 2.16. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. They follow me. Satan will try to place obstacles in our path. But in Jesus', in Jesus strength, we can walk forward following our Lord, obeying him and advancing the gospel, the gospel of peace. All soldiers need to be prepared to run or move forward in battle when called upon to do so. They never know when the battle will hit. We need to have the shoes of the gospel of peace so that we can keep moving towards the kingdom of God and practice godly ways. We also need to have on the shoes of the gospel of peace so that we can be prepared to share the good news with anyone who wants to hear it. Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah chapter 52, starting in verse 6, I'm going to read the NIV version. Therefore my people will know my name. Therefore in that day they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, 
who bring good tidings. If we wear the shoes of our God, we don't need to worry about anything. We just need to focus on the battle at hand. The shoes we fight in are the shoes of peace. It sounds contrary. The shoes we fight in are shoes of peace. As they help us to proclaim true peace to everyone. And they are shoes of preparation because they equipped us for battle, for the battle that we face in life. So how goes the battle? The word preparation here means to be properly ready to preach the good news of the kingdom. Are we ready to preach the gospel? Are we ready for the battle? The fourth item in the armor of God is the shield of faith. The shield of faith. Hey. The shield of faith. And listen to very different pieces of the armor of God. Notice how Paul says it here in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Above all, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The Weymouth uh, New Testament version says, Take the great shield of faith on which you will be able to quench all the flaming darts of the wicked one. The soldier's shield was his first line of defense. The Roman shield was also known as the suctum. It was a large metal enhanced wood shield that was heavily popularized in Rome for tactical use in group attacks or defense moves. They also had a smaller circular shield around about three feet across called a parma, which had iron enhanced in the middle, but its frame was mostly used by the light infantry. The suctum was, also, was often too big to protect the whole body. I mean, it, it, it was big enough. Uh, and actually, a soldier would actually be able to crouch down behind it with a hail of arrows were coming in and would take all the arrows and wouldn't hit them at all. He was able to hide his whole body behind it. They also, they also fought behind it, too. As you can see right there in their, in their stance, they would actually stand behind the shield and they would put their sword through there to, to attack and defend themselves. And they could put them up there to protect themselves against a hail of arrows that would be coming towards them. The purpose of this shield of faith was to deflect the fairy, you know, fairy darts of the enemy and to prevent them from ever making contact. Multitudes of Christians fall on the battlefield and fail to overcome evil because they wait until they are immersed in the fires of temptation before making any effort to resist. At that point, it is often too late. As you soon recognize, a, a fairy dart, you know, sailing towards you, there is, there is no time to lose. Hold up that shield of faith and do everything in your power to keep as much distance as possible between you and the temptation. If we yield without a fight, we are in reality inviting temptation. The shield was not held loosely in the soldier's hand. It was firmly strapped to his forearm so that he could resist the mighty blows of an enemy's sword without fear of dropping it. Likewise, Christians cannot afford to have a flimsy faith while in the heat of a spiritual battle. So how goes your battle? The shields of old were 
also often of a distinctive nature, sometimes marked with the insignia or the name of the king to help soldiers avoid fighting their own comrades in the confusion of battle. In the same way, when the devil sends his flaming arrows of temptation, we are to hold up the shield bearing the name of our king of kings, Jesus. Through faith in his name, we can resist any enticement. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. When Satan attacks with doubts, the shield of faith turns aside the blow. When temptation comes, faith keeps us steadfast in following Jesus. We're able to withstand all the devil's darts because we know whom we have believed in. This faith is not something that comes from within us. It's God's gift to us. He gives us a measure of faith. He gives us a measure of faith. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3 says that. He gives us a measure of faith. Then as we walk with him, that faith grows and it develops until it becomes a shield. It becomes a shield, protecting us and allowing us to live a victorious life in Christ. This was Paul's experience. He said in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer... I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And near the end of Paul's life of faith, he declared, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. That can be our experience as well. As you use the shield of faith to turn aside the crazy things that Satan hurls at us. Satan finds the weaknesses in our armor. And he aims very well. The shield of faith moves to cover the weakness when we don't have the knowledge or the strength to face a situation. Our shield will never fail because God is always faithful to us. Psalm 33 and verse 20, the NIV version. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. The shield is one of the most important parts of the armor of God. The shield of faith is, has a very specific function, which the Bible makes very clear to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Not some, but all of them. All of them. How goes the battle? We need faith. We need a shield. We need a shield. We need to remember to bring it every day. It's part of our Christian uniform. The fifth item is the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Ephesians 6 verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation. And take the helmet of salvation. The helmet protects the head. 
perhaps the most vital part of the body since it's the seat of thought and the mind. Helmets are usually made of very strong leather or they could be made of brass and it's very important to put on your head and wear because a blow to the head will be fatal. The Roman helmet was the Galea Cassus. Um, helmets had changed their form over the centuries of the Roman history. Most had, uh, had a peak on the top or the back of the helmet, and they had side pieces protecting you from flank attacks. A uh, picture there is uh, like a normal one that somebody would wear, and there's a centurion's helmet. The helmet of salvation is protected most the most important part of your body, again, the mind. It protects your mind. Satan's main weapon is lies. He wants us to doubt God and our salvation. The helmet is there to protect our minds from doubting the truth of God's amazing love for mankind. When we have a sure knowledge of our salvation, we will not be moved by Satan's deception. When we are certain that we are in Christ with our sins forgiven, we will have peace that nothing can disturb. I want to show you this slide here because there's a part that's called the Gala Epineurotica, which is part of the covering of your skull. And that's the, the actual name of this uh, covering of the top of your skull. Where's also where we get the name for the helmet that, they're, that they wear. Again, a Satorian helmet. So how goes the battle? We can be certain of our salvation. Or can we? Can we be certain of our salvation? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. Salvation means to be saved or delivered from something. The helmet of salvation protects us from thinking ungodly thoughts by helping us to think the way Jesus Christ thinks. It helps us to focus on God's goodness to deliver us into his kingdom. 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. The, the New Living Translation, I want to read that version of it, it says, but let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wear in our helmet the confidence of our salvation. The helmet of salvation protects our heads, our minds, our thoughts, our hopes, and our dreams. If we fail to put on the helmet, we are leaving ourselves open to all kinds of evil warfare that will affect our minds. We need the helmet to protect us from our media. 
So much trash is being spewed from the media outlets. If we spend most of our time listening to this garbage, our minds will become mush. Hebrews 2, verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How will we escape? How goes the battle without your helmets? The helmet of salvation is what keeps us going as we see our future. The kingdom of God. Nobody can take that from us. Nobody can take that from us. Only you can take it from yourself if you forget your helmet. Forget to put it on. For, forget to keep it on always. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says, Seek you first the kingdom of God. That is what the helmet is all about. Keeping our heads straight. Keeping our heads on track. In the game. Satan is swinging a battle axe. Are you protected? Are you protected? There's many instances where you can see where people in the Old Testament neglected to have their helmet on and they died. Item six. Item six of the armor of God. The sword, the sword of the Spirit. The sword was the most common weapon in battle. Indeed, the word sword appears 449 times in Scripture. The other ornaments of God's arsenal are defensive in nature. But the sword is primarily an offensive weapon. Or is it? The word gladius acquired a general meaning as any type of sword. Uh, the use appears as early as the first century AD in the biography of Alexander the Great by Quintus Curtius Rufus. Um, the Republican authors, however, appear to mean a specific type of sword, which is now known from archaeology as having been, had different variants. There was different types. Uh, the the gladii were two-edged for cutting and had a tapered point for stab and during thrusting. A solid grip was provided by the knobbed hilt added on, possibly with ridges for the fingers, as you can see on there. Now the one right there on the, on the left is the, the mates gladius from that region and the other one is from Pompeii so where they were originated that is how they would acquire their names uh, the blade strength was achieved by welding together strips for which case the sword had a channel down the center or by fashion in a single piece of high carbon steel rhombodio in cross section now the owner's name was often engraved or punched on the blade. And the names were again based upon where they originated at. Here's another, another type here. The sword of the spirit is the only weapon in the armor of God that can be used offensively. But from the Bible we also learned that it can be used defensively. Fortifications, arguments, and evil thoughts are all weapons the enemy uses against us. With the sword of the Spirit, the word of God, 
The people are equipped to deal with them all. We must put on the full trust in the Word of God and know it is true. Have confidence in the value of God's Word. God's Word, the Bible, is described as living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword from any two-edged sword. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Jesus used this weapon when Satan tempted him in the wilderness. To each of Satan's efforts to lead him into sin, Jesus replied, It is written. It is written. And proceeded to quote scripture to destroy Satan's temptations. God's word is truth. Again, John 17, 17. That's why it is so powerful. That's why it's so important that we study the Bible and become familiar with its truths and its power. David wrote, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, 105. The sword of God's word both protects us and destroys our enemy, the devil and his temptations. The sword of the Spirit, the Bible, it guides us into the godly way of life. It helps us to be proactive in fighting Satan by cutting straight to the core of the matter and uncovering the truth. Put this whole thing together there's a couple examples I want to show. You can see that the, the sword is attached to the belt of truth, which is holding everything in place. And look at the size of that shield. You can duck underneath that. God doesn't give us a little shield. He gives us one that protects our whole body. Again, here's another example of it with all the different terms. Of course, they did have this scarf that went around their neck and that just helped that the metal being around their neck wasn't chafing around their, their neck. So they would wear this, wear this little scarf and then, of course, they showed the tunic. And here's another one of the Roman legionnaire. I wanted to buy one of those, but they're pretty expensive. Actually, I like to be up here giving this sermon with that wearing all that. So that, that would have been really fun. And I don't know if I can wear the tunic. But that's what they wore back in the day. <laughs> in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 7. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. The word of truth, the Bible. In Psalm 149, 149 and verse 4, it says, For the eternal takes pleasure in his people, and he will beautify the humble with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. A two-edged sword in their hand. In Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16, the Bible says, He had in His right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. This is a picture of Jesus Christ with the truth coming out of his mouth as a envisioned as a sword, a two-edged sword. 
Now the ancient soldiers, they, they used these swords for cooking, splitting, kindling, and cutting the ropes that bound their captives to set them free. Likewise, the Word of God is a practical tool for every area of life, as well as in fighting the devil. In Bible times, there was no stainless steel. A sword, unused, became rusty, dull, and pitted. Swords were kept clean by frequent use or by honing them against stone or another soldier's sword. Iron sharpens iron. Proverbs 27, 17. So when we study the Bible with others, our skill in the word is sharpened. A soldier traveling in enemy territory never left his sword out of reach. I remember that in the army. I had an M16. It was in an arm's reach. You do not leave it alone. Same with the sword. Same with the word of God. In this way, a Christian should always be ready to give defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you. With meekness and with fear. That's First Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. So how goes the battle? How goes the battle? Did you bring your swords? I see some Bibles out there on your lap. Do you study your sword? Is your sword sharp or is it dull? How sharp is your sword? It means that we study the Word of God. It means that we know the Word of God. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We have now covered the six items of the armor of God. Here's a good picture of them right there. and Fighting off those those flamey darts that are coming at them. We have covered all six items of the armor of God. But wait. But wait. Isn't the completeness of, in God's nature usually has seven? Number seven. Now I'm going to read... Verse 18. But I want to share one final thought with you here. All the armor of God, the uniform that we wear as Christian soldiers, is of absolutely no use unless you have a fighting spirit. Unless you have the morale to win. How do we get morale to win? Prayer. 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 Although prayer is not one of the pieces of the whole armor of God, Paul closes his list by saying, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Verse 18. Even when you are clothed with the armor of God, you need to bathe it all in prayer. Prayer brings you into fellowship with God so that His armor can protect you. Here's how it is put by Barnes. It would be well for the soldier who goes forth to battle to pray, to pray for victory, or to pray that he might be prepared for death, should he fail. But soldiers do not often feel the necessity of this. To the Christian soldier, however, it is indispensable. Prayer crowns all lawful efforts with success and gives victory when nothing else would. 
no matter how complete the armor, no matter how skilled we may think we are in the science of war, no matter how courageous we may be, we may be certain that without prayer, we shall be defeated because God alone can give the victory. Any general knows that victory almost always depends on which army has the element of surprise. In the story of Gideon, the soldiers were chosen based on their watchfulness. And they caught the enemy sleeping and won through surprise. Even the best armor is almost useless if the soldiers are found dozing. We are commanded to be watchful to this end with all perseverance. Ephesians 6, 18. Continuing on there. Here are some other Bible verses to add weight to this point. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 41. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, stated in, um, in Mark chapter 13, verse 33. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 6. Therefore, not, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. How goes the battle? All prayer. All prayer. Verse 18 there. All prayer. Essentially is the same thing as praying without ceasing. As mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17. This does not mean that we go about on our knees all day long. Rather, we need to be constantly aware of God's presence and that there is an enemy that is stalking us. In the story of Nehemiah, we find that God's people were under constant threat of attack as they were rebuilding the wall. This group was a good example of this ready watchfulness. In Nehemiah chapter 4, Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 17, those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his swords, sword girded at his side as he built. And no one who sounded, and the, and the one who sounded the alarm, or the trumpet was beside me. They were aware. They were aware. As we conclude this, we have seen in Ephesians chapter 6, that the Apostle Paul lists specific elements of spiritual armor that God makes available to us. He compares the defense of God's servants against Satan's influence to the belt of truth around your waist and a breastplate of righteousness. He describes their combat shoes as whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. Their shield is their faith in God and in His Son, Jesus Christ, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Their resolve is protected by the helmet of salvation, the assurance that in the steadfastly serving and pleasing God, as they obey, they will receive eternal life. The one offensive weapon that they can use to cut to ribbons Satan's attitude and philosophies is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Indeed, all the elements of the armor listed derive from Scripture. 
So it is vital that we be studying and meditating on the Bible on a regular basis. Finally, Paul says, pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Indeed, regular prayer is essential to maintaining our nearness to God. These are essential keys for warding off Satan's efforts to regain control of and over the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. As 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18. The more our character becomes like God's perfect nature, the less Satan will feel comfortable in our presence, and the more he will be inclined to flee from us. Daily suiting up in the armor of God can feel abstract, but with prayer and with practice, Christians can better understand and implement the habits of putting on the full armor of God. Romans chapter 13 Romans chapter 13 is the last scripture I'm going to scriptures I'm going to mention. Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 11. And do this, knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in reverie or drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife or envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Admiral Lord Nelson may have fared better if he had taken precautions and had some type of armor. He did not, and he made himself very noticeable as a prized target out there for the French sharpshooter. With all his experience, you would think that he would know a little bit better than that. He would have learned a lot from the Apostle Paul, as I hope that we can. Admiral Nelson, he won, his, he won his battle, but he lost his life. How goes your battle? 